could see the, the, the grass parting of the buffalo was coming towards us. And as he merged out of the long grass, into the, started to come up the termite mound, I shot him through the, between, between the shoulder blades on the hump of his neck, and he, luckily he dropped right there. But we ended up shooting that buffalo 11 times. And it turned out afterwards that on his, on his vital triangle area, where there were five shots through his vital triangle. You could put, and I put my hand, I could cover all five bullet holes with my one hand. And yet that had, <laughs> had made no difference to that buffalo whatsoever. He came for us like he was, nothing was wrong with him. Hi there, I'm John McAdams, founder of the Big Game Hunting Blog. And in this video, we are joined by a very special guest again, Dr. Kevin Robertson. We talk about Cape Buffalo hunting in this episode, and like you just heard, he has some absolutely hair-raising tales of hunting buffalo in Africa. In addition to hearing the rest of that story that I teased at the beginning of this episode, Kevin is going to give us a general overview of Cape Buffalo, like where they live, why they are so darn mean and tough, an overview of their anatomy, how to evaluate a trophy Cape Buffalo, and much more. Just like with our other discussions on bullets, ammo, and rifles, he knows a lot more about the subject than I do, and he literally wrote the book on hunting Cape Buffalo. Now, Dr. Kevin Robertson is a veterinarian and a licensed professional hunter. He began his veterinary and PH career in Zimbabwe, and he wrote the best-selling book, The Perfect Shot, where he shares his extensive firearm, ballistics, and general hunting knowledge. He also authored the book, Africa's Most Dangerous, which focuses specifically on hunting Cape Buffalo. And he has also recently published an updated version of The Perfect Shot, titled The Perfect Shot 2. All of those books are outstanding resources for planning a hunt in Africa. Okay, let's get back to our discussion with Kevin Robertson on hunting Cape Buffalo in Africa. All right, well, Kevin, it is great having you back on the show again today for a third time. My pleasure. I've been looking forward to this for a while. You know, so we have started our last two interviews with stories about how you have seen things go sideways when hunters have used inappropriate bullets and rifles for hunting dangerous game in Africa. Since we're talking buffalo today, and since those creatures are known for their toughness, do you have a similar story that illustrates just how tough uh, Cape Buffalo can be? I do. Uh, and it occurred in 2007. Uh, I spent four months during the hunting season in Katata 12, which is in Mozambique. Uh, and Katata 12 is just south of the Zambezi River in what is known as the Sand Forest. It was uh, an interesting time because uh, in four months we saw buffalo every day, but buff not one buffalo looked me in the eye in four months. So the buffalo, they were very traumatized, um, Mainly during the, the Civil War, the, the, the Russians had come in and had shot 80,000 buffalo, and they had the Russian whaling fleet off the mouth of the Zambezi River, and they were just shooting these buffalo with, from helicopter gunships and then just cargo slinging the carcasses to, the, to these whaling ships to, to be turned into corned beef for the armies that were fighting. Anyway, that's so, and it was quite often because we would see these cannon shells in the middle of the forest. You'd be walking along in these huge big sand forests, and then all of a sudden you'd find a 20 millimeter cannon shell, and you couldn't figure out how the heck that cannon shell got there. And they must have been just been, been out of a come out of a helicopter gunship. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the buffalo they were very spooky, and they were, but they were absolutely huge, enormous animals. Their tracks, we said, you know, their tracks were the size of a, or a toilet seat almost. So I had my client was a guy from Washington State, a uh, very nice man. And we were just trekking a lone old Duggar boy. This was in July, and uh, it had rained a couple of days before, and the grass was still green and tall. And we were actually following the tracks of this bull through grass that was tall as our heads. It was actually rather a hair-raising experience. In that area, they have got very really large termite mounds, almost the size of half a basketball court. And on these termite mounds grow big trees, and there's... And the tracks of this particular bull skirted around one of these big termite mounds. So I got the tracker just to climb onto the mound just to, to look ahead. And as he got to the top, he, he crouched down and you could see pointed with his eyes. And the buffalo, it turned out, was lying just on the other side of the, of the mound underneath a tree. So we crept up onto this termite mound and you could see the buffalo. He was facing away from us, lying down, facing away from us behind the tree. But there was a, 
a fork in the tree, and you could see his spine in the shoulder region through this fork in the tree. And the, the pup was only about seven or eight yards in front of us. We were really close to him. And I said to my client, just shoot him in the spine through the fork of the tree. But my client, he was not mentally prepared for the occasion. I think the, the mere fact that the buffalo was so close to him and he was just not ready for it. And the buffalo eventually just sensed us. And one minute it was lying down peacefully trying, you know, chewing the cud. The next minute it was up and in full gallop sprinting away. And I shouted to my client, go! And as I was, before I could say shoot, he pulled a shot off at this rapidly disappearing buffalo. And then the buffalo just disappeared into this head high grass. And all I saw was a black shape. And I was totally unprepared for it. But I managed to snap a shot off it with my 505 as it had this dark shape. I just snapshot it almost just a, like a quick shooting a quail going away shot. Mm-hmm. So my 505, up until now, I've carried my 505 for nearly 20 years at that stage. And I'd never had a sh- fire more than two shots at any animal with it. That's on a Magnum Mauser action, and normally I'll just put three, the magazine takes three cartridges, so I normally would just put three cartridges into the magazine and then chamber around, so I had three shots. But something just, something just made me, made me think otherwise, and for the first time I ever did it, I, I chambered a cartridge, and then I opened, turned my rifle upside down, and I opened the magazine, and I put another three cartridges into the magazine, so I had four shots. And then we waited for half an hour and then we took up the tracks of this obviously very lightly wounded buffalo. We could have a little bit of blood, in, but that grass was taller than our heads. And I was, oh, it was the most nerve wracking experience. And eventually the, we tracked it for a, oh, for a while. And then eventually the, the tracks skirted around another of these big termite mounds. So I, my client and I, we climbed on top of the termite mound and in front of us was just a absolute sea of grass as far as you could see, a whole a sea of head high grass. And while we were watching, I saw the grass move and I saw the, suddenly saw the tip of that buffalo's horn and he was actually waiting in the grass for us. So, he, so my client and I just both started shooting blindly into the grass, um, roughly where we thought the buffalo was. And he was shooting a 458 lot and he also had four shots in his magazine. And of the recall of the 458 lot was uh, probably not as great as my 505. He, could, he shot off his four shots just as I was finishing my, just fired my third shot, he, he shouted to me, I'm out. And I was, as I chambered, as I, so I knew that I fired three shots and I knew I had only one shot left. And as I chambered that, my fourth cartridge, the, the buffalo charged us. And luckily the grass on top of the termite mounds is more nutritious than the rest of the grass because the termite mounds are, uh, you know, they have better mineral content. Mm-hmm. And that grass is normally grazed a little bit shorter than the grass. We could see the, the, the grass parting as the buffalo was coming towards us. And as he merged out of the long grass, into the, started to come up the termite mound, I shot him through the, between, between the shoulder blades on the hump of his neck, and he, luckily he dropped right there. But we ended up shooting that buffalo 11 times. And it turned out afterwards that on his, on his vital triangle area, where there were five shots through his vital triangle. You could put, and I put my hand, I could cover all five bullet holes with my one hand. And yet that had, <laughs> had made no difference to that buffalo whatsoever. He came for us like he was, nothing was wrong with him. And it turned out my, my initial shot had actually hit his left kidney and it scrambled his kidney. So, and a kidney is a very fatal, fatal shot. It hits something in the kidney and the kidney gets a, lot of, a large amount of blood after the, after the brain. The kidneys get the next most amount of blood in the body. So his, his one kidney was absolutely scrambled. And he'd had five shots through his heart lung area and he still charged us, which is just, and to the day, and I often, often think back on that incident and what would have happened if I'd only loaded three cartridges in my rifle? Um, I, it was just an absolute eye-opening experience. And, I'm not done, and I don't really know why I did it. I just suddenly decided to do it. Something just sort of forewarned me that uh, maybe I need to put four shots into this. And uh, thank God that I did, because I think he would have definitely got to us if, if I hadn't have done that. And both my client and I was standing with empty rifles. So my goodness. It was a real eye. Oh, geez. So you said 11 hits, five through the vital triangle, one that hit the kidneys, and then one more that you shot from from down top through his spine that that put him down. So seven really good hits on him? Yeah, seven times. And there was a very famous incident in in Zimbabwe when I was a a PhD. The story went round of an American client who had shot a buffalo 
14 times with a 460 Weatherby. And the joke was that they reckoned at the end of the 14 shots, the client looked worse than the buffalo. <laughs> he <laughs> was uh, he's damaging from his nose and both his ears. And the next day, he developed two massive black eyes like he'd had a fight with old Mike Tyson. I mean, you shoot 14, shot, 14 shots in quick succession of the 460 Weatherby, and that's, that's, bound, <laughs> that's bound to hurt. But that's, <laughs> that's, you know, the, the saying with the buffalo goes, if the first shot doesn't do what it's supposed to do, the next half a dozen just cause a buffalo a, a minor irritation. And that's, that's very true. I mean, I, when we cut open that buffalo, that Mozambique buffalo, I mean, his heart lung area was shredded, and yet he's still charged with, with determination, you know, so... Truly amazing animals, and that's, I think that's what just makes them so special. You know, you say buffalo, when you start messing with the buffalo, when are you going to die? And I think that's where the, the appeal comes in, is that element of what is definitely a dangerous animal, and that's, you're putting yourself, your own life at risk for an, an animal's life, and, and that, that's what makes them such worthy opponents, in my opinion. No, I definitely agree. You know, so why don't we why don't we rewind a little bit and why don't you tell us how you first uh, got interested in hunting buffalo? How did your relationship with these animals get started? Well, that's also an interesting story because I was they say you get thrown in the deep end and that's exactly what happened to me. So I, I grew up in a from a medical family. My father was a dentist and I grew up on the coast and I used to surf and but I always had a fascination of guns and hunting and I used to love reading Guns and Ammo magazine and I used to read. All that Elna Keith and Jack O'Connor and Warren Page, all those American gun writers, I was very familiar with their works. But I always wanted to be in the outdoors, so I, I studied two years of agriculture at Maritzburg University, Peter Maritzburg in Natal, and then I got the opportunity to be accepted into on the support to do, to do veterinary science. Uh, this was in the 1970s, and it was the, the stage of the heart of the American, after the Zimbabwe Bush War, the terrorist war. And in those days, the, the farmers fought the war. So the farmers would go six weeks in and six weeks out. And then when the farmer was fighting off in the army, the wives would stay on the farm uh, to look after the farm and keep the farms running. But as the war hotted up into the middle of the 1970s, it became too dangerous for the women to r remain alone on the farm. So they would go into town when their husbands went into the army. And then those farms were basically unprotected. There was nobody on the farms. So when I was at Maritzburg University, uh, my first year, they, the Rhodesian security forces came around to recruit agricultural students to, who wanted to go and be farm guards. So you would go to the farm for your vacation, your July and December vacation, and then you would look, be on the farm while the farmer went into the army. Uh, I always liked it to be a little bit like the dangerous thing. I'd done a year of national service myself, so I, I accepted that challenge, and I used to go to Zimbabwe, or it was just... Uh, with the still Rhodesia in those days and uh, and guard farms for my university vacations. And that's how I eventually met my my lovely wife and her parents owned five farms. I always joke, I said it took me a long time to find a Rhodesian farmer that had four daughters and five farms. <laughs> and uh, I eventually, uh, when I, so then I got into veterinary school and I, I did uh, I qualified as a veterinarian in 1981, which was just after the Bobby Independence. And by that stage, my parents, my future parents-in-law said to me, they had five farms and two and a half thousand head of cattle. And they said, come up and you marry our daughter. You come and we'll make you director of the company. You can live on one of the farms uh, you, and you can manage our cattle. Well, that's what I did. So we Kat and I got married on Lake Kariba soon after I qualified. And this was in 1981. And we moved on to a ranch uh, outside the town of Kuroi, which is the last of the town before Lake Kariba and the Zambezi Valley. And then, so we had a thousand cows, so there were 40 bulls, and the, the ranch that we lived on, and which I eventually bought from our parents-in-law, housed all the bulls. And uh, we used to make our African laborers wear bright red, pillar box red overalls, so that we could see them when they were walking around in the felt. And uh, I sent this, I had this one African, I used to nickname him Lightning, because he was the exact opposite of the saying, as fast as Greece lightning. His actual name was Kalunga, and he used to amble along like he had arthritis, and it used to <laughs> irritate the hell out of me, because I like mm. to see guys walking with a bit of enthusiasm when they were tasked with a job. Anyway, I sent him to go and check on the bull, and about an hour later, he came back, and he was in a very 
state of affairs. His overall was torn and he had a big scratch on his leg. And in Shona, he said to me, Ah, but Lapa no kona sata no mombi, which means there's a devil bovine. And he then would imitate it with his arms, how the horns look. He curled his arms over his head and he snorted and pretended to imitate a charging buffalo. And they said, Ah, lo, bas, lo, nyati no kona blalamina, wants to kill me. So I was most, because this was, this was in the export catchment area. So when, let me just backtrack a little bit. So Zimbabwe in, in the early 1980s, when it became, when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, as a form of international aid, the European Economic Union, the EU, gave Zimbabwe the right to export 8,100 tons of deboned hindquarter to the Smithfield market in London. That was deboned pin corn finished uh, beef. And the whole country, because there are buffalo in the Zambezi Valley and all the buffalo are carriers of hoof and mouth disease, there were, the whole of the Zambezi Valley was fenced off with a buffalo proof fence. And then that, that was the red zone. And then there was what they call the, quarant- the, the green, the, the quarantine zone where there were no cattle allowed to be. And then there was the commercial farming area. And this farm that we kept and I was staying on was in the, the beef export catchment area. And 80% of, of buffalo in Zimbabwe are carriers of foot and mouth disease. So, when he told me that there was a buffalo in amongst the bulls, I, my immediate reaction was to go and see it. And if it was, I just was going to shoot it because I was very worried. Because if we had an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease, that would be the ex- end of our exports. And the cattle industry was just booming. But the prices had quadrupled. Everybody was making money out of their cattle. So I jumped on my motorbike, and all I had was an old 303 Lee Medford from the anglo World War. It had a front sight was wobbly, and the stock was broken and bound up with copper wire. And I rode down, and sure enough, in amongst the bulls, there was a buffalo cow standing there. So I, um, without hesitation, I shot it uh, five shots with that, or three or three, managed to kill it with the first shot. Anyway, I took the head off, and I sent the head into Harare to the veterinary research laboratory with a note saying that this buffalo had been shot in the export catchment area, and didn't hear anything on it until about a week later. It was in the middle of the night. The phone went. In those days, we had those old party phone lines, and... Uh, I answered the phone, and whoever was on the other end was sounded miles away, and it turned out to be Dr. Stuart Hargreaves. He was the director of veterinary services. And I said, and he was phoning me from Perth Bright, because Perth Bright is the world reference laboratory for hoof and mouth disease that's in the UK. And he mm. was phoning from a back room, and he wasn't speaking very loud. He said, I've just got your results, and I'm planning to tell you that that cow that you shot that tested positive for all three strains of hoof and mouth disease. It's SAT, Southern African Territory. So there are three different strains of hoof and mouth disease in Southern Africa, and that buffalo was positive for all three strains. Oh, my. And he said to me there over, over the phone, he said, listen, if this gets out that you shot a foot and mouth, buff, foot and mouth positive buffalo in the export beef export catchment area, that will be the end of our exports. And he said, you just keep quiet about it. You get hold of the farmers, and you just tell them that if there's any buffalo coming to that area, they notify you, and I'm personally ordering you that's your responsibility to go get rid of every buffalo that comes into the farming areas. So my first, ad, very first animal that I ever killed, or every hundred, was, was a buffalo. And over the next 20 years, uh, we must have shot about 100 buffalo coming into our area. And for some reason, they were all cows. Not one of them was pregnant. And they all had corpus luteums on their ovaries. So I subsequently found out it's called gene, gene dispersal. These cows just go walk about. You know, for some reason, they would leave the confines of Mana Pools, which was not too far away, or the hunting area of the Zimbizi Valley. Somehow get through that, that buffalo-proof fence and then just come wandering into the into the, the commercial farming area. And then for all lightning, I, I, used, to, I used to dip cattle on, on a different farm every day, and I used to take my herdsmen with me. And about a week later after this incident, I was on a, one of my brother-in-law's farms dipping the cattle there and some of the cattle were missing. Then I I sent old Kalunga off to go and look for them and he got, and he walked and there was a big termite mound and he saw what he thought was that one of, one, of, one of my cattle standing on the termite mound and he shouted it and it didn't move. So he threw a stone at it and got chased by a second buffalo. So yeah. <laughs> in, like, within two weeks he got chased by two buffalo and then eventually he just said, no bugger, he's not going to be a cattleman anymore. It's too damn dangerous. He wanted to become the gardener because <laughs> it was just too, too, uh, too dangerous for him to be uh, walking around. So, that, so eventually uh, we shot so many of that used to come into that area that I eventually stopped testing them. Everyone that we tested was positive. And, uh, and that's because buffalo 
are every buffalo over two years old is a, is a carrier of foot and mouth. They say 80% of the buffalo are hoof and mouth carriers. That basically what it means is 80% of the buffalo are two years or older, are older than two years old, because the buffalo are born free of hoof and mouth disease, and then they get their colostrum immunity when they drink the their first feeding is that colostrum, that butter rich milk, and that basically vaccinate them for the first six or seven months of their lifetime. Then they pick up, when they lose their colostrum immunity, they pick up the, um, the, the virus which is circulated in the herd and then they go through a viremic state which means they have the virus in their blood so they develop antibodies against that virus. And those antibodies push the, the virus into the squamous cell epithelium of the throat, that's the lining of the throat where they where they sort of say so the antibodies can't get them and and that's, that buffalo is then considered a carrier. And every buffalo older two years old is, is, is a carrier of hoof and mouth disease. So is this a case so where, long, long. Where, where the hoof and mouth doesn't really hurt the buffalo, but if, and it, will, will it hurt a person if you eat a cape buffalo that was carrying hoof no, and mouth? it's not a zoonosis. It doesn't affect humans. But it is, hoof and mouth disease is, uh, is one of the most contagious diseases known to man. And it's a disease that's, is known to change governments and cause economies to collapse and things like that. So it's a, a very nasty disease. I mean, if they have an outbreak of foot and mouth in South Africa, they stop exporting table grapes from Cape Town, that type of thing. It's just a disease that nobody wants because it's just, it is, once you get it, it's very hard to control it, especially in Europe where they have lots of awful weather, lots of, you know, no sunshine and lots of rain and fog and mist, which, because it's a virus, and the virus is killed by either drying out, uh, we call that desiccation, or it's killed by ultraviolet light. So Africa has got a masses of viral diseases, but, but with a relatively dry climate and lots of sunshine, it does, those diseases are easier to control, as opposed to in Europe where they have this awful weather and then you just cannot control the disease. I mean, hoof and mouth actually blew across the English Channel in a fog once. So they had an outbreak in France and eventually just blew across the Channel and they had an outbreak in England. So they're paranoid about it. And just an add-on to that, in the, in the middle 90, 1990s, I mean, exports went well for a long time, and the, uh, Zimbabwe was free of foot and mouth, until I think in the middle 1990s, there was a consignment of, of beef was on a ship, because the beef used to get railed to Cape Town, because it was chilled, deboned hindquarters. So it was very good quality meat, and they would put it on a refrigerated ship at Cape Town Harbour, and it would go take it by sea to Southampton in London. And... When the ship was on the equator, near the equator somewhere, um, there was an outbreak of hoof and mouth in Zimbabwe. But that occurred in the low field from the Wanky side, the other side of the country. And they opened the, the doors of the, the, the fridges and they chucked 8,000 tons of beef into the sea. And that, the, the Zimbabwean cattle industry collapsed within, within 24 hours. The cattle industry collapsed. My goodness. So, so that's, uh, then that's how I got into game and I got into hunting and all the other parts of my life, but it was basically just being thrown in the deep end just to protect the Zimbabwe's cattle industry that I got involved with hunting. And as I'm sure you've known, once you've hunted one buffalo, it's just like getting HIV. Once you've got it, you've got it. <laughs> you know, I've, uh, I've, I've been involved in the safari business for almost 30 years now, and I've never met a client that said, okay, I've hunted a buffalo, that's it, I'm done. You know, clients will come and they'll shoot a good sable and a good roan and a, a lion and a leopard and all that, but one thing that they'll come back for time and time again is a buffalo. I mean, nobody goes and shoots 100, 100 could you, but I mean, someone will go and shoot 100, hunt 100 buffalo in his lifetime for sure. It's just that attraction. Yeah, if I had the money, I darn, I darn sure would be doing that. Yeah, no, it's, uh, so I hope that answers that part of the question. So I was just basically just got thrown into the deep end, and then I just became absolutely fascinated by them from then. And then since then, they just become my absolute fascination. Ended up writing that little book in Yachty about them. Then I've also written a, a more comprehensive book called Africa's Most uh, Africa's Most Dangerous, which is just a my, almost a my thesis on buffalo. Well, let's talk a little bit more about buffalo, like where they live and, um, you know, a little bit about their natural history, that sort of thing. Okay, buffalo are just basically, they bovines, they are they ruminants, they classified as a, a bulk grazer, so they, they've got this big, hard, rubbery mouth, so they can't really select, they just select their feed, they're just a bulk grazer. In order to survive, buffalo need four things, they need 
shade, they need water, they need grass, and they need mud. That's their basic survival. Also, they occur in areas which are both inhabited, well, were inhabited by the tsetse fly. And the tsetse fly is a nasty little creature that transmits the disease called sleeping sickness. They were in Ghana to cattle. So wherever there were tsetse flies, human habitation was not there because people couldn't live without their donkeys and their dogs and their goats and sheep and all that. And those are all very susceptible to the bites of tsetse flies and the disease called in Ghana. So, the, so the, when, the, when the Africa was settled in the colonial times, the settlers all went to the more hospitable climates where it was higher and cooler and there were no tsetse flies because the tsetse fly cannot survive over 1,200 meters of altitude. Uh, so the higher areas, and that's where the better rainfall was. So when, like in Rhodesia, for example, all the, the better parts of the country were colonized for growing crops and ran, ranching cattle. But the Zambezi Valley and all the, the low-lying areas was where there were tsetse flies, and that's because there were, there were tsetse flies. There were basically no people living there, so that's where the game thrived. So there are five different types of buffalo. There is what we call the the Cape, what is known as the Cape Buffalo, that is probably a bit of a nomad. Its proper name should be the Southern Southern Buffalo because that occurs in South Africa and Botswana and uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and it goes up into Tanzania and Kenya. That's then you have in the tropical rainforest you have the dwarf forest buffalo. Then you have the the Nile buffalo, which occur in the Nile system. Then you have the Western Savannah buffalo, which are also up north in Africa. But by far the most common, the, the largest distribution of buffalo is the, what we known as the southern buffalo or the Cape buffalo. And those are the ones that are hunted most regularly as, as part of the, of the big five. They are, buffalo is just basically a walking stomach. I mean, you have to, see the grass he eats is not all that nutritious and it takes an enormous amount of grass. So, to fill up a buffalo's stomach. So a buffalo's stomach is basically the size of a 44-gallon oil drum. It's about 200 liters capacity. And it sits on the left-hand side of the animal. And what you don't want to do, so that's one big thing we see when we talk about the anatomical features. You never take an initial shot at a buffalo if it's quartering away from his left-hand side because that bullet will have to penetrate through three or four feet of very densely packed grassy material like and uh, and I quite often if the wrong if the bullet's too light and it's already expanded quite often it stops in the room when we hunt buffalo they always said the first shot should always be with an expanding type bullet and then your backing shot should be with either a solid or a cup nose solid and the reason for that is that invariably the buffalo's running away from you after your first shot and you have and very often you get a left hand side quartering away shot and if you had if you get to the heart lung area that means you have to shoot through the room and then very often a soft point bullet doesn't get to the rumen, especially on the if it's fully expanded. So we, we recommend the first shot always with a soft point so that makes a nice big permanent wound channel and then the second and third shot if it's time for them is with a solid so that they can penetrate the full body length of a buffalo if it's running away from you. So that answers that question. You know, so buffalo are known for having having kind of a, a poor disposition, right? Ill tempered and for being really tough. Why can you tell us a little bit about buffalo behavior and how you think they've developed that sort of reputation? Well, they are just always grumpy, you know. They was I'm sure they all just wake up with a hangover every morning or a headache every morning. But there's another reason I've got a a, a theory, and it's very difficult to prove that I believe it contributes to the toughness of all African game animals, but buffalo in particular. During the at the in 18, 18, late 1890s, there was a, a disease outbreak in the top of Africa known as the rinderpest. And the rinderpest is a, a viral disease which is endemic to Asia. And this disease has always been associated with war or conflict of some kind. And it's speculated that when Genghis Khan invaded Europe in the 1200s, he brought the rinderpest with him. Because those, in those days, the army, when armies invaded, they had bullock carts which pulled their equipment and they also had herds of cattle which were used to feed the, feed the armies. During the Napoleonic Wars, much of Europe was de 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 devastated by the Rinderpest as well and that was also associated with the old Napoleon and the French moving cattle around and stuff. 
Anyway, this disease got to Africa and and it broke out in 1890. And there are three possible reasons. Old Lord Kitchener was in Khartoum with the British, the Germans were in Tanganyika, and the Italians were in Eritrea. And it, and that's where it broke out. And this was a new disease. And every and it, so rinderpest is a disease of cloven-hoofed animals. So every animal with a cloven hoof that's from a giraffe down to a little diker was susceptible to this disease. And and over the subsequent eight years, it, the disease lurched its way through the length and breadth of the African continent, killing an estimated 90% of the cloven hoofed animals in Africa. So there's very little recorded history of of those times. The best is from the writings of uh, of Frederick Corte Salou. He talks about the avenging angels sweeping down from the north, and he describes what the conditions were like in Matabili land, where he was, where he, he estimated that 500,000 head of cattle, domestic cattle, died as a result of the Rinder Pest. It was a very interesting time for me because it was also the start of, um, of veterinary science. So, so Arnold Tyler, the guy that uh, started the veterinary school where I qualified as a vet, he was a, a Swiss veterinarian. He was brought to Africa by uh, Paul Kruger, who was the president of the Transvaal, to try and d- diagnose what the disease was. And, in those days, there was only one veterinary officer, a guy by the name of Charles Gray. He was a, a colonial veterinary officer in, in the Cape Colony. And then these two vets traveled to, to Matabelian, and they were the first to diagnose that uh, this was the Rinderpest. And I'm sure it contributed to the Anglo War, War, wars were fought over it. But what I believe, how that changed uh, in Africa is that the predators, that's the lions, leopards, hyenas, wild dogs, all have a short gestation period and they respond to times of plenty. So it's well known in the drought years when all the other animals are having a hard time that the, the predators do really well. And I believe as this Rinderpest was lurching its way through Africa, killing animals in untold millions of numbers, I believe it was followed by what is known what must have been a predator population explosion. So the predators would have bred quickly because of there was just so much food for them. They didn't have to hunt. They were just carcasses everywhere. But then there was a there, there must have been a fine tuning period because after the disease had passed on, only ten percent of the animals remained, and I believe they were subjected to a, a massive amount of predator pressure. So in a natu- in, a, in its population, there's always a, some percentage of the population is naturally immune or by chance don't get infected. So they estimate that ten percent of that of wild wild animals in Africa survived the disease. But then they had to be. They, I believe that they were subjected to a massive amount of populate predator pressure from what must have been hundreds of predators who in themselves would have died then off quite quickly if they'd run out of food. But those, So the descendants, every buffalo walking around alive today is a descendant from those buffalo that survived the disease and then survived what I believe was this massive amount of predator pressure. It's also quite interesting if you follow the writings of Africa, when those predators... Um, when they could, didn't have anything to eat, they turned to another form of protein, and that was Homo sapiens. I've just finished watching that movie, The, the Ghost in the Darkness, about the man-eaters of Tavo. Mm-hmm. And what is the coincidence, and I've actually seen the Tavo lions that they're in the Field Museum in Chicago. They, that, the, that whole incident occurred two years after the Rinderpest had passed through. So I'm pretty sure there's a connection between man-eaters and, and the Rinderpest. But I also believe that the buffalo, I mean, have you seen a, a buffalo... Lions attack a buffalo, and you think, well, he's just about done. And sometimes then a, a light seems to go on in the buffalo's head, and he, next minute he's jumping up and he's fighting back. And I think that that's that instinct, that that's the survival instinct that a buffalo's got, and that's just what makes him so darn tough. I also think he just produces adrenaline by the by the, the bucket load, because when you take another animal with its heart shredded, it just sort of dies pretty quickly. But a buffalo just doesn't seem to, it just seems to be different. He's built like a like a Sherman tank. My, I had a good, my, the, the late Dr. Don Heath was a friend of mine, and he told me that once on a routine culling operation in the Gonorrhea Zoo, he cut open an old buffalo bull's heart, and in the medial septum of the heart, that's between the left and the right ventricle, there was a callous 303 bullet was in the buffalo's heart. And that bit callous there, it must have been there for, for years. And that bullet, that buffalo survived with a 303 bullet in his heart. So they just they're just different. I mean, they they seem to have a just a bad attitude. You know, the and my last experience, well, the last 
most recent buffalo I had to shoot in self-defense occurred in 2016 when I was at the Southern African Wildlife College. And uh, we had a, we had PH students in the, on an 18-month PH course, and these students were just finishing up their training, and we were allowing to do practice hunts. So one student would be the would be the tracker, one student would be the PH, and one student would be the client. And then we had a a laser torch in a in a old piece of water pipe that was put into a, the stock of a Bruno rifle, and we put sights on it. So you, when you wanted to take a shot, you would actually just push a button, and you. This laser would shine about 200 meters, even in bright African sunlight. So then, then I would then photograph. So like when, the, when the student would take the shot, I would just then photograph the animal with the wherever the green dot was as proof of a of a kill. And on this particular occasion, it was in November. It was after the drought, and uh, we found the tracks of a lone dugger boy, which the tracker tracked. And then we caught up to him pretty quickly. He was walking on an elephant path. So the PH then took the client into the stalk, and we got to about 50 meters from the buffalo, and the buffalo did, but then had sensed them, turned around and looked at them, and the guy, the client, put the rifle on the sticks, and he, he said, I'm in a the PA said he could shoot, and as the shot, I, there was suddenly a little green dot appeared on the buffalo's chest, and I quickly took a photograph of it, and at that moment, that buffalo just said, don't point that at me, and he just charged us, totally unprovoked. He just came for us. and But he came for us in a sort of, he was a little bit wobbly in his back legs, and it turned out after that he'd been bitten by a, bitten been more by lions than lions had bitten him on either side of his spine, and uh, had these nasty punch wounds full of maggots. But it, and he came. We tried to shut him down, and it didn't work. So I, we just we just stood our ground and we backed up into a bush, and then I shot him at five paces with my 505. And uh, but that was just he was just sore and angry and. And he, when we eventually we reported it to the ranger, and he eventually just said, "This buffalo attacked a car the day before and messed up one of the tourist cars." So I mean, you just just like that, you know, just charge you for no, for no reason. Kind of got a bad attitude anyway, yeah, yeah. and then then he's injured and in pain, and he's even he's even more or- ornery than usual. So yeah, that's not really a surprising uh, behavior. When you talk on the behavior of animals, all animals have an imaginary three circles around them. The outer circle is what we call the safe zone. That animal says. I can see you and you not you far enough away from me that you don't pose a threat to me. I'm quite happy just to stand and look at you. And as you walk towards that animal, that animal starts to feel uncomfortable that his being space has been threatened, and then he starts to move. And that we call that the escape zone. He moves until he feels safe again, back in his in the safe zone. The inner circle around the animal is what we call the attack zone. And and buffalo are particularly Notorious because buffalo live, to, they age like humans do. They get cataracts in their eyes. They have tick infestations in the ear canals. So eventually their ear canals get callous and close over. They get arthritis. They get in their hip joints. So they become grumpy old men. And if you happen to be, and because they start losing their hair, so they often go and lie in some thick shade. And if you happen to walk up onto a buffalo like that, especially if you're walking into the wind so the buffalo doesn't, he doesn't smell you and he doesn't hear you and you suddenly, that buffalo just suddenly jumps up, jumps up in front of you. It's very common. That's when they just come for you because that's in their attack zone and they just, they just don't like people being too close to them. And that's the, that's the real danger of if you're just walking in a, in a wilderness area where there buffalo occurring, to be safe to you, just don't go and look for trouble. Don't walk in those areas where a, a buffalo could be lurking in some reeds or in some, you know, uh, in some thick grass, because that's if you do walk into him and, and you, you you bump him, he'll just he's going to come for you and sort you out. Yeah, that was a bunch I, uh, of, of uh, very information, very interesting information you just you know, put, put out there. I uh, I remember you talked about the your theory about the rinderpest epidemic in your book Africa's Most Dangerous. And I thought it was fascinating, and like you said, who knows if it's actually true, but it's a darn good explanation uh, for a lot of things going on in Africa, and and who knows it may well be. And like you said, buffalo are just you know they're just tough animals, and and like you said, survival of the fittest. That was literally what was going on with them, and that that may very well explain uh, what what the deal is with buffalo. And if nothing else, it makes for very interesting uh, campfire discussions. It certainly does. We now live in Zimbabwe. We live very close to Mono Pools, which is a very famous game reserve, and there are no restrictions there. You can get out and walk and do your own thing, and and quite often people get injured there. And I remember there was a honeymoon couple because, and they were walk, wanted to walk down to the river, and there was a Gwasha Radonga, and uh, the husband jumped over it, 
and it was too too wide for the his new, newly married wife to jump over. So she stepped down into the stonga as a buffalo walked around the corner, and the buffalo just took one look at her and just hooked her and and killed her. Um, and we were in monopoles at the time. I remember trying to we were trying to get to help them get the body out and things like that. And that was just wrong place at the wrong time. And normally, that would have been a kudu or something like that. It would have turned and run away. But that's, she just jumped down in front of this whole dugger boy who was ambling along. And, and he just, just, he just hooked her. And that was one hook was all it took to kill the, the, young, the young lady. I'm very unfortunate. My goodness. Jeez. Oh, man. Well, shifting gears a little bit, can you tell us a little bit about Cape Buffalo trophy evaluation? How you would... Um you know what? What makes a good buffalo? What's their what's their characteristics for their horns? In my opinion, a good buffalo is an old buffalo. Um, I've been on a one man crusade for the last thirty years to try and get Safari Club International to change the buffalo scoring method. Let me just let me just back up a little bit. The buffalo are basically sexually mature in their fifth year. So all animals become sexually mature when they attain two thirds of their genetically determined body weight. So, how, so sexual maturity is a function of weight, not age. So how fast the animal grows determines how quickly he gets to that weight, determines when he goes through the significant hormonal changes in his life. So buffalo sexually mature starts when, he's, when, he, when he is in his fifth year, but he has to wait until his boss, that's the hard bony bit or hard horny bit on top of his forehead, is solid enough to, to withstand the pounding it takes when they fight for the right to to be socially dominant. So no buffalo gets to mate with a buffalo cow until he's first had to fight and win a fight for social dominance. So if you know that you, if you want to become uh, reproductively successful, you need to gonna have to win a fight. If you're a human, you'd go to the gym and start working out to make sure that you win that fight. So how does a buffalo work out? What he does, as his boss is developing, and he starts fighting with trees and bushes. He'll take a, a small tree or a bush and he fights it like he's, 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 the devil's after him. And what he's doing that, doing that fighting, he's developing his neck and his shoulder muscle for, those, for that confrontation that's going to occur. But, but while, he's tree, while he's horn rubbing or fighting a bush, what it does, it also starts to wear down the tips of his horns. So there are two different methods of measuring buffalo. The one is what we call the Roland Ward method. That's the old British method. And that's just the straight outside greatest width. It's got nothing to do with the horn tips. It's just how the wider the buffalo, the better it scores. When a buffalo looks at you with his, with his ears alert and, if they, and his ear tips are in good condition, they often get torn and ragged when the bull gets older. And the alert in buffalo ears, when the ears are pricked and lurked, the distance between those ear tips is between 31 and 33 inches. We normally say it's about 32 inches. And we also, when we hunt in Africa, we talk in hands. Your hand is five, uh, six inches long and four inches wide. So if your buffalo is looking at you, and you can imagine you can put one hand span on either side of his alert ear tips, if the horn spread is greater than that, that's a 40-inch buffalo. And everybody, that's the magic figure. Everybody wants to shoot a buffalo that's 40 inches or bigger. With some buffalo, you can put two hands on either side of his ear tips, and then he's in the 46 to the 48-inch inch, inch bracket. The, the, the SCR, the, 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 the Safari Club International scoring system, measures around the curl. So it measures from the tips all the way around the curl, across the front of the boss, to all around the curl on the other side. So as a buffalo, as he gets older and he starts wearing his horn tips down, and you'll often see old dugger boys where they're, they're broomed off, their horns are very blunt and, or sometimes even broken. They score less and less. So if you, if you go into the record book of SCI and you look at the the highest scoring buffalo there. All those buffalo were shot, in my opinion, before they'd even had a chance to breed. And that's, that is not sustainable. You know, the, we all know that hunting is a very important part of conservation. But hunting needs to be stand on four pillars. It's got to be socially, succe- uh, socially acceptable, which is having a hard time now because people think it's un- unethical to hunt. It's got to be financially sustainable, it's got to be ecologically sustainable, and it's also got to be genetically sustainable. And we know for a fact now that in the breeding of buffalo, if you take a 50-inch buffalo bull and you mate it with a 30-inch buffalo cow, by what is known as the quantitative additive state, the average 
size of the, the offspring of that mating will be 40 inches. So you take the, the two, add the two measurements together, divide it in half. Same, there's a 70% chance that if you mate a 15 inch buffalo cow with a 15 inch buffalo bull, there's a 70% chance that the resulting horn spread of the progeny will be, will be 40, inch, 40 inches. Um, with a 15% better than average and a 15% less than average. So if you keep on going, shooting all the, the best bulls before they've had an opportunity to breed, it's only logical that you're eventually eliminating those, those genes out of the population. And eventually the poorer quality bulls breed, and then by the same quantitative additive state, the trophy quality just decreases. So this is a research project I did when I was at the Southern African Wildlife College. Next to the Next to the Kruger National Park, which is South Africa's very famous game reserve, are four privately owned nature reserves, the Umabat, Trimavati, uh, Klaseri, and Bululi. And they have very well-regulated hunting operations there, which pays for the running costs of the, the reserves and also mainly for the, to keep the anti-poaching, keep their rhinos alive. So what we did, and when they, before they, they, work out the, the quota for each hunting season, the buffalo in those reserves are all individually counted. And they used to count them with a, with a helicopter, but they found that the helicopter was just too noisy and the buffalo didn't like it. Now they've got these, what they call light sport aircraft, these little pit foxes and sort of light sport aircraft with Rotax engines, which are very silent. And with a very good quality camera, they were found that if you flew over these herds and you can just photograph the herds with this good quality camera, and they've got the technology now that stitches the photographs together, you can actually get a really good count of the buffalo in each area. And then I've been doing work on aging of buffalo and coats, and uh, when they heard of my success, the method and how I was getting, uh, had a system of how to look at a buffalo and, and determine its age, they gave me these photographs to say, listen, can't you do anything with these photographs? And the quality of the photographs was so good that you could actually see oxpeckers on the buffalo. And I initiated a research project where we, we photographed all the buffalo in the, in the APNR, and then we, I got two students from Oxford University, and then we were teaching artificial intelligence computers to age and to trophy assess the buffalo. So first of all, uh, did, we did, and for the first time ever, we looked at the size of the buffalo cows in the population. Nobody had ever done a survey to, do, to see how big, what is the average size of the buffalo cows in the Kruger National Park, for example? Nobody knew that figure, and we finally got it out. So when we, on the, to train, the, to train the, um, the computer, we would determine if it was a male or a female. And then if, if it was a male, we just looked at the sexually mature male, and we divided the bulls into a bull that's uh, sexually mature, that's five to seven years old, and then a bull that, breeding bull is eight to 11, and then, 12 years and older was a post-breeding age dugger boy. And then we divided the trophy size into less than 30 inches and then low 30s, which was from 30 to 33 inches spread, and then mid 30s was 34 to 37, and then, uh, then no, 36, and then 37 to 39 was half 30s, then low 40s, mid 40s, half 40s. And we did this complete survey. And we actually put uh, 14,000 buffalo into the computer. And what it was, we would fly, find a herd and fly around it and photograph it at all the different angles because you need the buffalo needed to be looking at you to be able to judge the width and the ear pit. So we'd also have a little siren on the, on the airplane and it'd make a noise and the buffalo would look up at the airplane and then we could photograph them like that. And then we took that, that information and we compared it to the, to the uh, survey of the buffalo in the Kruger National Park, which is the same, it's the same population, it's the same, there's no fences in between, it just, some buffalo live in the hunting areas and some buffalo live in the non-hunting areas. And we compared the two populations. And that work really set the alarm bells ringing. My, because basically all the, all the good buffalo were gone. They used to be there, but they were just being hunted out. And so as it now stands, with the technology that we've got, we can work out what is the average trophy size of a population. And the recommendations these days are that if you want to hunt a buffalo that's better than the average of the population, he's, he must be 12 years and old, 12 years old or older. So he's had every opportunity to pass his better than average genes on. And then if a buffalo is less than that with the population average, you want to get rid of him before he breeds. So you'd have him sell him as a management hunt or a management bull, and you'd hunt him as soon as he turns, he's eight years old, until his boss is just hard enough to 
make a nice trophy, but it has no opportunity to, to breed yet. So that would be that's the recommendation. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, yeah, that was fascinating. I had no idea uh, what you were talking about with that research project. That is very interesting. I've heard of the um, of of the hunting, particularly in the in the Klesiri, and I've seen you know how they do have that management buffalo that they've offered, and he's in a he is the cheapest one that they do offer. It's not cheap, but it is you know relatively less expensive than the other ones, and it is definitely like you said within that very strict uh, size constraints to to fit into each one. Like I said, just absolutely fascinating. Uh, what you're talking about, and um, you know, so if you if you were king of the world and you could change the SCI method right now to incentivize what you're talking about, how would you do it? Well, I still think it's not that widespread, but there needs to be more emphasis on the box. So I would believe you take the Roland Ward method, which is the greatest spread, and you add to that the over the top measurement of each boss in inches. So you just have, <clears throat> excuse me. You have spread with, you know, the, the, the SCR method is when you measure the boss, you use a caliper. So it's not, um, it's just a straight line length. It's not over the top length. You know, sometimes we get these buffalo that look like they've got two cannonballs on their heads and they've got these massive big bosses. And you need to, need to have some sort of recognition for that. So my suggestion would be the Roland Ward straight line greatest outside spread width plus the over the top method, uh, over the top width of each boss in inches and then just make that as a total, as one total. So you did like a 40 inch spread with, with 20 inch bosses, that bull will be 80 inch, would have you an 80 inch buffalo, if you understand what, what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. No, I definitely understand what you're, uh, what you're talking about. We, and Sorry, go ahead. We've got, <clears throat> there's got to be, I, I, I get it on social media all the time, these people posting pictures of these really beautiful bulls that are shot in their prime and we just got, it's just public awareness. People are just got to realize that that's just not sustainable anymore. We know now that the buffalo is most active from being able to aid these buffalo and living in the Kruger Park for four years. I've, we see which buffalo do the work. And the buffalo, he's, from his late in his eighth year until his late in his eleventh year, that's when he's an active breeding bull. Also, being a herd bull for a buffalo is very stressful and very difficult. First of all, they always graze at the back of the herd because when the buffalo herd is grazing, he grazes. They graze zigzag into and across the wind uh, because the wind tells them of uh, if there's any predators up ahead. The bulls are always, and when the lions attack the buffalo herd, the lions attack from the rear. So the buffalo graze at the back of the herd, which means they're grazing on grass that's already been trampled by the herd, in, herd members in front of them. They also spend a lot of their time guarding and spending off different challenges. And I, I had a very good example of how. Kat, my wife and I, we went and had a barbecue at, at one of the dams in the Kruger Park. And uh, there was a buffalo herd who was lying there in the, in the mud wallowing and just ruminating. So buffalo needs to ruminate for eight hours a day. It needs to chew the cud for eight hours a day. And he either does that standing or lying down. He cannot walk and ruminate. He's either got to stand and ruminate or he's got to lie down. And we watched that buffalo herd for five hours. And there were two herd bulls. It wasn't a particularly big herd. But there were two dominant herd bulls in that herd. And they did not stop walking for five hours. They just walk round and round this herd. They're on guard duty because that's when the, the buffalo are lying down, that's when they're vulnerable to attack by lions. So when the buffalo is a herd bull, he, the quality of his food decreases and he doesn't get enough time to just lie down and chew the cud. So he quickly starts losing body condition. And when he loses body condition, he gets challenged for that really privileged position. And when he, if he loses that challenging fight, he then leaves the herd and he goes and joins up with a, some bachelor, bachelor herd where they watch rugby and drink beer and just talk boys talk. Mm-hmm. And that's a very important time for that bull now to regain the body condition he lost when he was a, was a dominant herd bull. And then he'll, then he'll re-challenge to get that position back into the herd again. So we have this continual movement of bulls in and out of the herds. And the people say, oh, I shot this old Duggar boy because he was with a bachelor group. But they said, no, it might be he was with a bachelor group, but that bull is still of breeding age. He's just on R&R. So during his, during his three-year... Uh, 10-year period when he's of breeding age, he might join and leave half a dozen herds in his lifetime. And a lot of people are under the misconception. Now, they make this excuse, now I shot this bull in the bachelor herd, that's why he's got to be a dugger boy. We can now, accur- now age bulls so accurately that we can say, no, that bull was only eight and a half years old. He's only going to turn nine in February next year. 
So there's this method that we use. We take the first molar tooth, that is the third tooth from the bottom, from the bottom jaw on each side, and we measure with a caliper the crown height. That's the enamel or part of the tooth in four places on each corner of it. That gives us eight measurements. We plot that on a graph, and that gives us the buffalo's age in years. This was work was done by a guy called Dr. Russell Taylor when he did his doctoral thesis in, in, in uh, Rhodesia. So we, then we take the, so the teeth tells us that buffalo is eight years old. Then we look for the other characteristics which will also show if that, tell us that buffalo is eight. And we look at the, how solid the boss is, how sharp the horn tips are. And it, what is also very characteristic is as a buffalo gets older, he develops a, what we call a chin lap. He gets a little fold of skin underneath his chin. And that's, that is also a secondary, it's also a result of the hormonal influence of testosterone. So we can very accurately age buffalo. And we know that Buffalo are born in the second half of the summertime rainy season, which is basically February and March. So we know when the buffalo's birthday is. So we can actually say that buffalo is 10 years old. is going to be 11 in February next year. I mean, that's how accurate we can get when we, with aging. I've done thousands now. I just can just look at a buffalo and I can tell you within, within a couple of months how old he is, I reckon. And we, so we, the emphasis now is that if you're going to shoot these really old bulls, they must they really spectacular bulls. I believe that they've got it. They should we should not be allowed to shoot them until they are twelve years old and older. You now with with lion hunting now, there's a, you're not allowed to shoot a lion unless he's six years old. I forget the exact figure. I believe that that's we should be starting to put regulations like that in. There's really special bulls. Give them the chance to chance to breed, and then also have management bulls. Have because there's lots of these ready. Bulls that have got no trophy potential, but some people like yourself would give your eye teeth just to hunt a buffalo. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a world record or fantastic buffalo, it's just the experience of hunting a buffalo. So I think why not hunt these poor quality bulls for the experience and also just get those genes out of the way so, and give the, the better bulls the opportunity to breed before they get hunted. And so, so like you said, shoot, shoot one of those bulls when he's six, seven, eight years old, something like that. I would say you should just shoot him when, he, when he's in his ninth year, when he's okay. eighth year. You know, so, he's, so his boss is still nice and hard. So when you, you can have a, a skull mount of him, you know, a, a European mount. Because if that bull is too young and you and you boil the boss and the boss is not hard, it, 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 um, it, you know, there's, no, there's no material, then that just gets boiled away. And I often look at the mounts of all these impressive buffalo that I see at all the safari shows. And you can see that buffalo, the taxidermist has been very liberal with his body, with his putty to make up for the boss that wasn't there. And they're trying to tell you this is a turn a six year old bull into a 10 year old bull, which just doesn't happen. So I have a, uh, I have a European mount of my, of my Buffalo sitting here in my office. Is that something that I could, you know, could you send me the, uh, the instructions on how to do the tooth measurement on it? Is that something I could do myself? Well, it's the bottom, it's the bottom jaw. Oh, I don't the have bottom the bottom jaw. jaw. Okay. No, <laughs> yeah. but send me, send me a picture of the, of the, of the mount, and I'll tell you exactly how that buffalo was. Okay. All right. He's got a darn good boss on him and uh, nice worn-down tip, so I'm interested to see what you what you have to say about it when I when I send you that photo. I will send you the photo. You obviously got some trophy photos of him when you, would, when you took the shot as well, didn't you? I mean, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I'll send you those photos, and I'll, I'll, I'll age him for you. Where did he come from? Uh, Southern Zimbabwe, right on the border with um, – right in that Crooks Corner area with the South Africa oh, okay. and Mozambique. With Ghana Reserve. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, not not far from there. Yeah. I'm, all the work that I've done on buffalo is from Buffalo south of the Zambezi. So I was approached by one of the Tanzanian professional hunters who told me that I was out in my aging, and he hunted those mountain buffalo. And I said to him, "Well, I might be out on I, I might be out on my aging because your buffalo eat green grass all year round. They grow faster. They probably." get sexually mature a year earlier than Buffalo south of the Zambezi when the low range to be low rainfall area. So maybe I'm out, but I explained to him that this whole thing about sexual maturity is a function of body weight rather than age. So you can, I'm not too familiar with how to age Buffalo from in the north of, 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 of Africa because I believe those Buffalo look a year older than they really are because they just got sexually mature, sexually mature earlier. And we know the buffalo's boss and all that is a, is a function of uh, hormonal influence because I've got photographs of castrated buffalo that have got no boss. And they just become an ox and they, they never develop a boss. They always just grow and grow. And those buffalo have their, have their testicles bitten off by hyenas when they, when they calves. And uh, they, they, they just become a, an ox. And they've been throughout the history. They've been 
a number of famous buffalo that were definitely males, but they didn't have testicles and they'd never developed a boss. They just got this, the horns just kept on growing. So we know from that fact, we know that a, a, a buffalo's boss is very much a secondary sexual characteristic, which is associated with, with testosterone, which is associated with sexual maturity, which is associated with weight and all those other factors that make the buffalo look the way we do. So for me, the oldest, uh, the, the oldest, the, the best buffalo is, is the, the oldest buffalo. So I, I took a uh, client on a, or a friend on a buffalo hunt last year in the, in the Zambezi Valley, and our, our mission was to go and find the oldest buffalo that we, that we could find. And it was the most fantastic hunt. We looked over 40, we aged 47 different bulls until we found this bull we just called Bigfoot. And I've just written a story up in, the, it's just been published in Sports of Field, the latest edition of Sports of Field. Uh, it's about uh, the hunt for our Bigfoot. And we found this buffalo had a massive, one massive big track. So much so that the uh, tracker said there's a giraffe in the Zambezi Valley. Well, there are no giraffe in the Zambezi, but it, the track was so big. Huh. Anyway, we followed this. We, we followed this bull, and he was he was wasn't putting any weight on that leg because and uh, his the metacarpal bone is broken, and, and he must have been like that for years because the hoof just grew and grew. Because as buffalo get more massive and more heavier later on in life, their front feet grow to to expand in size to compensate for that weight. And also when a buffalo walks, those old bulls, when they walk like they've got the all the problems of the world on their shoulders, they, they drag their front feet. And that dragging, continual dragging, wears the front edge of the, the hooves down. So when we're hunting buffalo, I believe you can actually almost age a buffalo just by looking at his tracks. So we just look for the biggest track that you can find. And if that big track's got, got a nice front, square or front edge, then you know that you've got a, a really old bull. And I believe age is... And that, those old bulls, that's when they get the character. They have all the torn ears, and you know, they just look characterful. Uh, young buffalo doesn't, hasn't developed any character yet when he's too young. He just looks too young and pretty. How old do you think uh, Bigfoot was when your client shot him? He was four, I, 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 said at least, I said at least 13, and he was 14 and a half. I actually got his, got his front teeth, and we measured it. And I, we formed that, hopefully, for um, a, a safari show, how we measured the teeth. Because you also hunted a... We saw the second buffalo that was uh, lions had been hassling it, and I was just about to fall over. And uh, when he shot at the, and that was a nine-year-old bull. And if you can, so I've compared the two bulls together and got, got their teeth as a comparison between a nine and a fourteen and a half-year-old bull. Ah, interesting. So, yeah, and no buffalo ever gets to makes it to sixteen in the Kruger National Park. So by the time the buffalo is in his fifteenth year, basically he's done. His teeth are just about worn out. And then when his teeth wear out, that's when he just basically. Either starve to death or the, the, you know, the lions take a heavy toll of those old buffalo because they become vulnerable when they, they get older. And that's another thing why those, I believe those old buffalo become more aggressive as they get older because they become more vulnerable. They, you know, they're losing their defensive edge. They've lost their, they don't hear as well. They're slower because of arthritis. They horn tips are now blunt. And they, they overcome their vulnerability by aggression, in my opinion. So they become a lot more aggressive as they get older. Yeah, they, 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 we, we just have, they just got shit in their liver. It's a, it's a, excuse my French, but that's a, an African saying. That he's, this old buffalo, he's just got shit in his liver. That's what we used to describe those real grumpy old bulls. <laughs> and they just definitely, they, and they just definitely become more aggressive as they get older. And I'm sure it's because they are becoming more vulnerable to to lions and, and predation. And they they can only way they can compensate for being vulnerable is by be, becoming aggressive. Well, I think that is a good place to wrap it up today. This has been a fascinating, uh, very interesting discussion. I really enjoyed having you back on the show. And I've read your books, and um, I I still learned a tremendous amount just from uh, talking to you today. So thank you very much, Kevin. That's a pleasure. I really enjoyed it myself. And uh, please remember to send me those pictures of your buff, and I'll gladly aid him for you with pleasure. All right, will do. Now, if you enjoyed this video please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel right now. Just click the red subscribe button below to make sure you don't miss out on any of my new videos on hunting gear reviews, cartridge comparisons, and more. Now, do you want to go Cape Buffalo hunting yourself? Click on the link in the description below or go to huntingguns101.com to get a free ebook I have written on the best hunting calibers to include a couple that will work great on Cape Buffalo. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. Have you hunted Cape Buffalo before? If so, where? How did it go? And what rifle, cartridge, and bullet did you use? 
let me know by leaving a comment on this video right now. Thank you for watching, have a great day, and good hunting.